welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We will, since <laughs> I will, I will explain a bit about how this session will go. That we will see in the while we keep talking. So I will say that my intention was to uh, bring Eric to into this space because I I have heard so much about his ideas of learning and and education and yeah it just the he has like a very very interesting point of view and i wanted to bring him into the conference and then he added me into the conversation <laughs> and then sierra also added me into the conversation so we have a first part of the session with eric and me also moderated by Sierra. In a way, we'll be asking questions, responding to things, like more like a dialogue. And then on the second part, the first hour, and then on the second part, uh, we will share uh, about uh, two stories about adventure versities. Uh, Sierra will give us like 10 minutes of getting it together. And if Hero can join, because he's in Ecuador, we don't have electricity there, he's trying to look for it. He will share about Siguiendo Pasos Andinos, which is a project that we're doing also in Peru, uh, in the framework of Adventureversity. So yeah, so this session, I'll cut it here. It's a uh, pump and dump, how to escape the empire, the predatory economy and the master slave relational dynamic plus practices from Adventureversity. So, so I pass it to you, sir. How would you like us to start? Thanks, Andre. I'm so excited for this session. Um, my name is Sierra. I'm one of the organizers here. Um, I think I know most of you. So it's really nice to be in the space. It feels like very cozy. Um, so Eric is my dad and the source of a lot of my course, my learning journey, my um yeah, the foundation for a lot of my um, explorations in life. And Andre is my dear friend, who also is like one of my greatest teachers. Um, and so, yeah, it's an honor to have to be here and to kind of help facilitate having them in dialogue and conversation. And I think there's something really magic about just like this thing around re relation. I feel like witnessing the conversations that they're able to have is a different conversation than I'm able to have with either of them. Um, and so it's it's just funny how I think um, learning works in those ways that different people connect um, in different ways um, and resonate different things uh, with each other. And so um, the, there's also this really nice connection um, through, uh, as Andrea said, rock climbing is something that's really core to, um, yeah, our journeys, something that we all really love and um, that brings us together. Um, and so, and also um, from different contexts, um, I think Andrea um, has a very distinct context, um, being a climber in the Andes from Ecuador, and my dad, who started rock climbing um, at an early age when rock climbing started becoming a thing before it was, you know, before people even knew about it, um, in Southern California um, back in the 70s. Yeah, in the 70s. Um, and so, yeah, just I'm excited to see we're going to kind of flow with the conversation um, and kind of you know, lean into the emergence of the moment. Um, feel free to pop in with questions or comments. Um, I want this to feel yeah, like a like a living room kind of sitting around the fire, kind of a chat. Um, and um, so, yeah, with that, um, I would love to just. Yeah, maybe invite my dad in first. Um, I think that the title of this conversation has a lot in it. <laughs> um, and I guess, yeah, if you could bring in, uh, first of all, the pump and dump part, what does that, well, what, the, what does that, um, what does that have to do with the rest of the title? Um, and then, yeah, maybe just a bit of your story um, in terms of how you came to um this like relationship between rock climbing and being in nature um and escaping the empire 
Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, say that it's an honor to be able to be here and to be with you guys. And uh, I'm sitting here early morning in the dark in the Yukon. <laughs> and it's kind of cold still. <laughs> um, I'll start with the pump and dump because uh, I'm not sure Sierra knows what that is. It's... <laughs> It's a, a term that comes from uh, the stock market investing. And uh, the way it operates is that you come out with a stock that people invest in, and then you pump it up and you tell everybody, oh yeah, you're gonna make a fortune. And uh, everybody puts their money in there and then you you dump it. And uh, the, the uh, people who are running the pump and dump scheme make all the money and all the investors lose their money. So uh, it's, it's sort of like the mode of a predatory economy. You get, you get people all psyched on something and then you fleece them and run away. So since uh, the topic was going to be about the uh, predatory economy, I thought it was a a, a good uh, title, but I guess a lot of people don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's sort of symbolic of how a lot of uh, our economic structures operate. What else did you want me to talk about? <laughs> um, if you could give a brief uh, story of how uh, rock climbing and connection with nature relates to the topic of um, escaping empire, like, like your personal story. Oh, real brief. Uh, the empire uses nature and takes it and then set, tries to sell it to you. And so if you can get what you need directly from nature, then you can transcend uh, empire and uh, escape the predatory economy. <laughs> and how did you figure that out? And it doesn't need to be brave, Eric. <laughs> this one is the... <laughs> we want a story. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, how did I figure that out? Uh, I grew up in the Philippines and I had a, a whole lot of Filipino friends and uh, the main thing that we used to do is go out into nature and play with stuff, sticks and spiders and climb trees and eat fruit. And uh, that was a real formative part of my life. And so I, I love just being out there with my friends and we didn't have any entertainment or any toys to speak of, we just uh, interacted with nature. And uh, that was uh, that was some of the best years of my life. <clears throat> and then coming back to North America, I felt completely out of place at, <clears throat> at age 13. So I was kind of like a foreigner in my own country and I never fit in with the high school scene and the, the sort of jock sport thing. And so when I f came across rock climbing, uh, I thought, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And so I spent a lot of time scrambling around on rocks and uh, it's, uh, it warms my heart that uh, what we started way back then is now really a big, a big deal, and and a lot of uh, young people are are being uh, blessed by it, including my own grandchildren. So, pretty excited. Uh, Ethan just bought Iger a new pair of climbing shoes, and he's so excited. <laughs> so yeah, it's great. And I'm curious for you, Andre, also the question around how, yeah, maybe your story into climbing rocks, climbing mountains, connection to nature and, and what that is. 
um, brought into your life? I um, I can share, like, I came from, and Eric also came, like, his background was, uh, his family was full of academics. And, yeah, he will share that story. I think it's, like, a really powerful one. Then I, I, I resonated with that in a bit because I, I was part of academia. Like, I was teaching in university in Ecuador. I was, like, like, my dream life was to teach in that university and to do research there. So it was, like, this is what I want to do. And then I, I did it, like, and I was there, and I was, like, is this it? Like, <laughs> because you just get to do the same thing every day. And I felt like, I felt like a little plant trapped in a, like, yeah, like a plant in a house. Like, it's not like, you, it's not bad to have plants at home, but I felt like I needed more, like, a, like I wanted to be in a forest or I wanted to just explore more things. And so I, I think... That also came because I I I started in a way because since I was little I used to be in the mountains in in Ecuador in the Andes, but at at the same time I was a lot of was changing in my life and I started to climb high mountains, and um, I don't know mountains have this powerful force to just for me they invite you to just let everything go. You climb, you go, you, you're there, and then just there is so much beauty that you actually forget the little things that are in your head. And I just kept like what I really wanted, that it was enjoy that, like the beauty and, and, and that powerful learning of letting go in a way. So I think that um, it was part of a, like this idea of, not being in academia and uh, like wanted to find other things. They wanted to find other types of adventures and then find like Ecoversity Space, which is uh, collaborating this conference. And it felt like arriving to a forest, like where where there will be like a lot of connections underground and will be a lot of nutrients and a lot of, of people and things. and. There, like the the climbing, the rock climbing part also came into my life because then I felt like, oh, then I'm so I'm not here to teach. Like in a way, I, I I'm not. Who am I in in a sense to to teach? Is like to I I want to accompany people. I want to get to know people. And then with the rocks and the mountains, they started to be oh, but I want to just be accompanied by mountains and rocks too and learn with them too so i feel like with the with uh rock climbing it has been like a like that's the thing that i just get very challenged and that those are the things for me that actually makes me kind of change the idea of being part of a system education system and like a space where you feel they give you the they give you everything like oh this is what you need to do to just fill the the checklist and you need to go here but with going on a path of adventure let's say that we don't know <laughs> with rock climbing or with mountaineering is like I feel like oh okay now we are in the forest where should we go and then we find people like Eric for example. <laughs> that has been doing this for so many years and I started like building this for so many years. And so you 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 say, oh, wow, they build all of this trail? Like, oh, there is so much here because we are like in the outdoors and we're not following. I'm, I feel like I'm not following like a normal path. And with that also, I would like to share, if, if you can share Eric, like through, like this difference between academia and rock climbing and nature and how like how are you putting them together in your life like if you see backwards how do you see that happening like there is like a like something that it's been told in the mainstream media right 
and how did you see with the rock climbing experience with nature connection how did you see that changing for you yeah i was just thinking while you were talking that uh maybe a good model to understand this is uh the idea of the false self and the true self and uh society and and our our social contexts builds within us this kind of uh, artificial construct of how we interact with the dysfunction of the world and uh so that's our false self that that it that is sort of a weird construct of all the dysfunctions around us and then we go into nature and we uh, interact with our true self because our nature doesn't uh, care what uh, weird ideas you have rolling in the back of your mind. It, it calls you to be in the present instantly. And it's that uh, feeling of, of connectedness in the now that brings us back into contact with who we really are. And uh, I think that's really a, such a great thing. So I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, yeah, maybe uh, I, I thought I should throw that one out there while it was still hot. <laughs> I have a curiosity. Um, you mentioned kind of feeling out of place when you returned back to North America after having grown up in the Philippines. And um, so the context you came back to was in, in Los Angeles, um, California, and in kind of the belly of the beast in a way. And I remember you, you telling me stories of how in those days, the smog was so thick that you couldn't even see the mountains. Like it was like really, really an environment that like you could, like that felt um, quite, yeah, like it's like the, the, the questions around the, um, the um, like it was it became it was very apparent or very present to in that moment that cultural moment of of sort of like where we were going as humanity where empire was taking us in terms of like impact on the environment and all of that and so I'm curious of like in that in that historical moment which I was not part of so I'm curious um, it feels like in some ways there was a lot of like rock climbing now is is so mainstream that you know like half of the people in a city have been to a climbing gym and um, all climbing gyms themselves are sort of like a, a, a bit of like that, the, the empire kind of like taking something from nature and like commodifying it, you know, um, and selling it back to you as you were mentioning. But I guess like my question is, is at that time, um, like what were like the, what was like the countercultural ideas that were like running through the climbing community? Um, or like, what was, what did that, what did that feel like? <laughs> well, there was a lot of countercultural ideas. Uh, the the one I I liked the most was articulated by a climber named Lito Tejeda Flores, and uh, he said that there's a leisure class at the top of the social spectrum and another one at the bottom don't get caught in between. <laughs> so that resonated with me uh, that it's it's way better to be a part of the leisure class at the bottom of the social spectrum than it is to try and get to the top. And uh, as near as I can tell, the quality of life is uh, better at the bottom than it is at the top. <laughs> So that's kind of uh, been a guiding uh, light in in uh, my uh, career to not have a career. <laughs> um, and how did how does that tie into the this idea that of the master slave relational dynamic? Ooh. <laughs> So 
So the master slave relational dynamic is is kind of the water that we swim in. So it's it's hard to to really think about it clearly because it's just such an integral part of the assumptions that we make about reality and how we operate within uh, so so social situations in particular. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's um, all about. Uh, not wanting to be a master and and a lot of our social and cultural conditioning is that you know you need to work hard and get to the point where where you uh, achieve mastery and then you can be the big boss and and uh, all of that so it's kind of heading in the opposite direction flowing away from mastery and and more into uh, servitude and and being in service to the entire structure is more important than being at the top and and uh radiating power down on those below you i'm i'm curious andre what has resonated with you around this topic you've been sitting with the topic for a little while now and in conversations with eric um a few times um and i yesterday you were in a session <laughs> um and i and you texted me um you were in the session of like forgiving forgiving cultural supremacy with Annabelle, and i wasn't there so i, I wish i had been but you mentioned you were like I actually didn't know what oppression, what the word oppression meant. Um, and so I'm just curious, like in your, like this, what's alive right now in, in terms of your learning journey and your like, um, yeah, framing of this topic. Okay. Um, what I want to share is like, so I know, of course, like Ecuador related to what you said and on, and there was also that, um, like the the session at the beginning i was like oh white supremacy like that's I, it's so far from my context because i'm from ecuador it just it doesn't yeah but i'm a, um we are organizing this so we are helping out with some rooms and things but it was like a beautiful session because i was like the translation of words and the meaning that they they have are very different in the context so i was okay oppression is a word, a huge word that might have so many branches and what what that branch means in Spanish or in my context. And I we were talking with the, with the facilitator and she, she told me like oppression will be like, if someone has power, how do this person uses that power? And yeah, that's like everywhere, right? Like everyone, use like when they have power what are their deep intentions and their deep um like motivations to in, when they are in in relationship with things um like in with work or with other people when they are walking in the street like how their their cosmovision is and how they interact with others right so i feel like like sharing about this from my perspective we i i'm i'm trying to figure out like what uh does it mean in, like in the americas as a like as a thing like because in the north there's a different way of enacting oppression and and this idea of master slave right and what does that mean in in the south for me it's like very very interesting because it's related to economics so of course like everywhere <laughs> but it's related to social status it's related to to that thing but what i i am um, like resonates a lot is this idea that eric shared about don't get in between like we have in the south all of this ideas of we need to develop the south like the south needs to be uh, we are third world countries 
or in development countries and we are not developed and we have all this idea of we are in between like we've been told that we are in between all the time because we are we don't manage to arrive to uh, like economical abundance or development right now ecuador doesn't have electricity for 14 hours a day so <laughs> we are like totally in another place but I I'm, I was like resonating with that, like don't get in between. So this idea of where, like how can our, how can our value system can be, like can change the story that we tell ourselves. So we can, we are okay with being at the bottom and are, we are okay in not entering that race or trying to be better, like, and that also brings my question to Eric, like you told me uh, once about um, the value system, like that you know that there's like a, a value system related to this empire that we live in, like in a way. So can, can you share a bit about value systems and, and yeah, what is it that there is in there? Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it, it seems like the value system of empire is to create inequality and uh, and hierarchical uh, structures. And I really liked what you had to say about uh, uh, getting caught in between. Uh, Sierra and I watched a uh, a documentary recent, well, a few years back by a woman named Black. I can't remember what her first name is. It was called uh, Kara Black. Yeah. What was the title of the documentary? Uh, world. What was it? Schooling the World. Yeah, Schooling the World, White Man's Last Burden. And it, it uh, if you haven't seen it, it's really good. And it was a real eye opener for me since uh, we were at the time uh, schooling, trying to school the world. <laughs> but so many times uh, when you have an interaction between a master uh, culture and, a, and more of a slave culture, at least if, if they've adopted that position, and which is what you do if you uh, buy into the idea of uh, a developed country versus an undeveloped country. Uh, the people who 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 are are co-opted into the in-between space are often completely cut off from their original culture, their their indigenous ways of thinking, and they never do arrive to the uh, sort of a dominant culture or the empire so they're they're definitely caught in between and that's that's uh <clears throat> the worst of circumstances i think because yeah and you can see it with indigenous people all over the world trying to navigate uh this this uh, master slave dynamic where where uh, the hope is that if I'm just a good enough slave, then I can eventually become a master. And uh, it's all an illusion. <laughs> it's all a lie. It's, it's part of the pump and dump scheme, I think. I'm, I'm wondering if you could like, from your point of view, like give, a bit of a overview of how this, how did you see that? How do you see this changing like in time? You shared like when you were a teenager, um, you started to rock climbing, like how was it like when, like what did your parents said? What did your family said? And yeah, how was like the, like, uh, like it's the ideas behind did because you kind of enter in another world but i would love to know like how the time changed with 
related to those ideas that you shared? I think uh, generally back then the culture thought that anybody who was a rock climber was uh, pretty much insane. And uh, which is part of the reason I was attracted to it because anything that the dominant culture rejected was something I was interested in. <laughs> but what was like, can you explain some of the, how can we picture insan insanity, like <laughs> insane on, in those times so we can see? Well, I think uh, American culture in particular was all about uh, being safe and and uh, and pursuing, uh, you know, the pathway that society laid out for you. And so, if you're a rock climber, you're you're all about assuming danger and going <laughs> the opposite direction. It's not that way anymore and as sierra pointed out uh, a lot of the ethos of rock climbing has been co-opted and commodified <laughs> but uh yeah that was the way it was back then and uh it was great <clears throat> it was <clears throat> it was uh, part of the whole sort of countercultural movement that was quite alive back then I'm curious um, to bring this journey to um, kind of where each of you are in your lives right now in terms of like this idea, like how I know um, for both of you um, bringing kind of sharing this connection that you have with the mountains, with rock climbing, um, with these ideas of um, being able to relate to nature as as friend as as somewhere to go to find sanctuary to find um resonance and to find strength um versus kind of the the mainstream still like less i think it's changing much uh, a lot but still you know, most movies and most of the media that and spoke of um still portrays nature as being very scary and it's going to get you and the bears are going to eat you and you're going to you know terrible things are going to happen and so I'm curious like yeah what um you wanted to share yeah some stories around how you were sharing this um the sense this this kind of gift that you've received also from the mountains um with others maybe Andre you can start um so this was really interesting because when we were planning this this conversation eric shared this thought that it's like oh the the how nature changed to be a friend and not like dangerous and i was like what? that's so true i i never thought about that like that literally like <laughs> that we were, and I know this in, in Spanish, we call it like agua tibia, like warm water, like something we all know, but it's hard to put it in, in words that clearly. And for me, I was like, <laughs> like thinking, oh, that's true. So we were built, like, I feel like being a mountaineering, uh, doing mountains with Hero that's also here we are like oh they are so bold and brave and and the, they get into dangerous things and la la and we are like not really like i literally never thought about like i i never thought like oh this is really dangerous i'm um, like that no we we get into like safety because we start to learn to walk a mountain step by step like we have this idea of, of circuits of learning where nature is our classroom all the time and we start like little by little because like society has invited us and the cities are inviting us to be every day into this like uh in the city like in in cars in classrooms at home so when we enter like a forest, we are like, oh, 
this this could have uh, snakes or things so we forget that that is like what is has always been there but we haven't been able to be there that much because the city kind of draws us to that so for me like this changing in my head the idea of nature being my friend has always been part of my landscape because i live uh, next to the mountains and even if it, i'm in the city it's there and I feel like uh, climbing and mountaineering and inviting more people in. We are part of also a mountaineering club in Quito. And that's how people, when they enter, when they start to be part of the club, we, there are some classes there where, so people can just start to, to be on mountaineering spaces. But in, from the technical part, uh it's so funny to see like how when they are in the mountains like people loses their senses like they are like a bit dumb because of altitude and they are like super slow because they are like i don't know what is all of this like oh <laughs> because we are like re-entering a world where it's like nature is safe is it's our friend and it's holding us and it's hard to say that because we are full of things from everyday life and we need to do this and checklists and things. So it's so, for me, it's like, it's really, really, I don't know, just it puts me in awe to see how when we have less things in our head, we kind of are like a bit numb, like, oh, <laughs> until we find ourselves, like, yeah, if that makes sense, I was building on that. And I'll pass it to you, Eric, <laughs> to share that too. Yeah, well, <clears throat> sorry. My uh, early years in, in the climbing game were in the context of uh, my parents uh, locked in uh, a ugly, uh, breakdown of their relationship that eventually uh, ended up with them divorcing. And I was at the age where <clears throat> I could understand what was going on. My two younger brother and sister were, were so young that they weren't really uh, aware. And my two older brothers were, <clears throat> had already left the house and they were off to college and whatnot. So I was caught in the middle of this. And uh, of course it was uh, pretty stressful where uh, my parents were going through this big identity crisis at the same time when I was supposed to be establishing my identity. So I was, I was parenting my parents, which was, was a weird, really weird circumstance. And I just remembered, uh, Whenever I would go climbing, it was like flushing the toilet bowl of my mind. <laughs> it would just go and it's all gone and I'm here and uh, I'm in the now and this is real and uh, I'm loving it. And uh, it was basically what, what enabled me to uh, sort of stay sane through that really challenging and difficult time in my life. And how have you shared that? Or like, I feel, <laughs> um, at least, yeah, for me and, and the community that my my brother and just the impact that you've made, the invitations that you've made to so many other people to also find that they're build their own relationships and connections to nature have been really um, profound, profound, just in a, in a very easeful way that you, you model that. And I'm curious you want to share I, I guess this is I, we, I think we can open for questions actually at this point and then this is kind of like a good segue into um what we're all kind of collaborating in together which is this initiative called Adventureversity um and yeah we can share a little more of like um what what kind of things that we're experimenting with um in terms of as as a sort of pedagogy 
um, the sense of adventure, the sense of um, relating to nature as friend? How do we invite others who may not have kind of the the that kind of experience before? Um, and and yeah, like you're saying, I, I have so many friends who are climbers who say, you know, rock climbing saved my life. Um, and like it's kind of like wait what <laughs> how does that work um so yeah i'm just opening up for for any comments um questions um for andre or for eric um and then or 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 stories of your own in terms of your relationship um to the natural world i don't know if there's any other rock climbers in the room no hello <laughs> um but he will come in in a minute to share some of their projects um but yeah any thoughts feel free to just on mic or type into the chat i, I can share something before we sorry mm -hmm. i was like having this in my mind about the um, so I, I also, this was something that came for me with um with conversations with Eric, like, so this, uh, this system that we live into has like a different set of values and I will bring that up again. And like, how can we change those set of values to be the ones that we want to, to have? Like in this finding our true self, like what does, those values means and how do we find them like that's like was something like oh it just resonated a lot and I will say what you shared before Eric if you want to just explain a bit more but this I, I found I found that this is like oh wow can I reset my set of values to what I want to hold for myself in my life and I remember that you said like the value system bring like this idea of wealth, this idea of the predatory economy that we are predators, like we are, we need to be better, we need to just hold those things. So the the idea of to create an alternative value system can bring the idea of uh, beauty, joy, and pleasure. And I will, I, if you feel like Derek to share a bit more about this set of values that you shared, or if you have more, or this are like the, the core. Yeah, I, I think that uh, within the master slave relationship, obviously there's no equality. And the whole foundation of it is, is inequality. And the more inequality, the better, the, the faster the GDP grows or, or whatever it is. And so all of us uh, have experienced the idea and the concept of love. And uh, I've come to understand that love cannot exist on any level and unless it is built on a basis of equality. And so our, our fascination with the master-slave relationship basically is at war with actual loving uh, relationships. And uh, I don't know if that's making any sense, but uh, yeah, I feel strongly that, that equality is, is, is a foundational idea for, uh, love and beauty to be able to function in the world. The other thing I wanted to say before it uh, ran off into the back recesses of my mind was uh, <laughs> about the commodification of climbing. Uh, I think Sierra and I had a, a, a discussion a while back on how uh, Climbing gyms and religion are sort of the same thing. So if you if you see interaction with nature in the raw as uh, as the real thing, 
and uh, sort of gym climbing as as sort of religious practice within uh, it, the the confines of a church or a cathedral. Uh, it's it's part of the way the way uh, <clears throat> empire commodifies and co-ops a a genuine experience and and brings it into something that, that can become part of the yeah, predatory economy. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting idea. So yeah, I'd like to hear from some of the rest of you. Hi. Hey, sorry, I have a poor connection, but I hope you can all hear me. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm really enjoying this conversation. I wanted to, um, well, let me backtrack. Um, first of all, it's, from my own experience, it's often very challenging to go against the grain, you know, and to be sort of an outcast or someone who does not you know, doesn't kind of conform to the convention that are manufactured by, you know, by propaganda that, you know, well, fine. Um, so it can be a very low is kind of wondering how do you, what's your experience with the sense of, you know, I'm alone. I've this rock, this solo rock journey, yeah. a social animal, a creature. Uh, Todd, I think we're not quite getting what you're saying. It is cutting out quite a bit. I wonder if you would, would, would you be able to uh, put it in the chat? I really want to hear <laughs> what you're, what you're sharing. But Hello? It's like yeah, we can hear like some words, but then it cuts out. So we can, we're not actually getting your full. Am I back now in a clear way? Yes. yes okay. Good. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I switched connections. It just dropped. But okay, I was just, my question simply is how, how Eric, what has, and Andrea, what have your experiences been with, um, with wrestling with the tension between the sense of, you know, I, I'm alone. I'm I'm on this solo journey. I'm you know I had this kind of lonely solitude of a, of an experience as being one human being, and yet I'm a social animal and I need community. I need to be social. I'd love to do do this with the group, but I also have to accept that sometimes that group is not going to be here. Sometimes we, we're looking for community of rock climbers or rafters or whatever a commune and they're not there. That's not our journey. That's not our existential path or what we're in our, what's in our, our world. So I was wondering like wh how you wrestle with that tension. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, just thinking about it now, I, I was, because <clears throat> in most uh, activities you have some sort of feedback from from the uh, the larger culture and and the people that you interact with and uh, for so many years early on in the Yukon I was I, I felt very much alone and that I was going out and doing climbs and discovering new climbing areas that were fantastic and uh, there was nobody there to actually go, oh yeah, this is really great. And so uh, it was weird, but uh, over time, as uh, my family uh, came along and they got into it, and then of course, now it's, uh, it's pretty much a, a huge deal. And so, I think, yeah, in any in any uh, sort of forum, somebody has to sort of go out there first and uh, and make the discoveries. And uh, so, yeah, it's great.
in a way I think it's like just the process though <laughs> I feel something like that <laughs> I will say just from my perspective also um, with my dad having like, yeah, I feel like like a distinct difference, like maybe 10, 15 years ago where he would have like, not just in rock climbing, but also just, yeah, getting out there and, and being exploring the the realms of like beyond kind of what's currently, like you were mentioning Todd, like accepted as like norm and is accepted, like really playing with like radical ideas. Um, that yeah some people would like look to him and be like you're crazy <laughs> like we're not going to engage in conversation like this is too much um but over time especially seeing like the intergenerational piece um with you know um, now my dad has grandchildren and and something changes as as there's as kind of the new generations come and, and there's a different um capacity for for like cross generational like emergence of of new of new understanding new knowledge new like consciousness um so i feel yeah like trust the process um and through friendships too i feel like yeah um and i feel and i feel that also what you're sharing Todd, like the deeper feeling behind that um, is somewhere that i've also been um quite frequently <laughs> so yeah, we can be together in the alone also. <laughs> and they, do you have anything else to share on that? No, I'm good. I would like, to, yeah, so the second part also, if we're okay, like moving on. Or yeah, any other comments, questions before we move? Questions, comments, ideas? Just then we put in the chat morning experiencing or feeling loneliness and wishing for companionship versus choosing solitude. Yeah, thanks for like Catherine. Mm. Yeah, I think it's mm. yeah. the dance. Mm. So also like I feel like the next part sharing about what these ideas kind of like I'll get the getting it together, uh, for example. And um, Siguiendo Pasos Andinos, they are uh, inspired by this conversation and, and they like uh, the, the idea of bringing new pedagogies into academia or not spaces and to talk more about how can we, what can we made up, like make up, uh, what can we invent, what can we create together? to just try to just kind of be different into this world or find our own set of values or find our true selves. So I feel like now maybe Sierra, you want to start with um, the getting it together? Sure, I can start with Adventureversities. Adventureversity, yeah. Which is the ecoversity that we're co-creating um, that emerges from this conference. Andrea, myself, Eileen, and Dan, um, who are who have been sort of the core organizers of this conference, and then are, um, yeah, it has grown since then to include. But yeah, who's back here somewhere, and um, uh, Hero, who's in this room, and other my my dad, and many other people who have like sort of joined. Um, but it's really an exploration, um, an experiment into how can we. How can we offer, um, how, how can we ourselves continue this exploration together um, in the ways that feel like we do have some sense of community in this um, kind of, yeah, meeting meeting bit of that need that you mentioned, Todd, um, and, but kind of resisting the, the sort of the typical, well, let's make a program, let's make a thing, you know, it's, it's really been very like step by step and very relational, really starting very, very small. Um, so it's not actually something that was like put out, you know, to the public really. It's really just like ourselves and our friends. Um, but giving it a name um somehow kind of gives it um more coherence in terms of like the continuity of the learning over time. 
So we've run many experience, experiments already <laughs> um, in many different places of the world with different friends. Um, and the two that we wanted to share about with you um, in this call, one is called Getting It Together, and one is called Siguiendo Pasos Sandinos. Um, and I will say one of the things, um, one of the core, I'll just mention a few of the core kind of uh, components um, to adventureversity that I think that we're all tracking um, is around reimagining leadership. Um, so in the way of like my dad mentioned kind of equality, what does that actually mean in practice? When you're going out into the wilderness, for example, you're going into the mountains, um, you know, the, the classic, sorry, Andre. <laughs> the classic um kind of hire a guide or who's the expert or who's you know how do we how do we really um celebrate you know what does what horizontal leadership look like um so that's one of the questions um there's a question i think one of the core values too is around um like gift gift culture um and um, how does when you're bringing yeah when you're working with different people in different contexts um, with different things to offer um, and different needs um, how do we how do we figure out the economics of these things together um, and and bridging between like having these adventures how do we you know let how do we open to really seeing the adventure or the mystery or the unknown, the uncertain as a guide itself? Um, and one of the things that my dad has told me my whole life is that it's not a really, it's not a true adventure if you, if you're prepared, if you, if you plan. So you have to, um, an adventure is where you don't, you don't actually know. There is like a sense of risk and a sense of like leaning into and trusting um, that nature will take care of you, um, both the external nature and your own nature, um, and bridge and like blurring that line. Um, and so, yeah, that's my intro on adventure versity. You're all welcome <laughs> to experiment with this, and also in your own ways, in your own places with your friends. Um, I'll, I'll maybe pass it to Eric to, to talk about getting it together specifically and the we run like three um, three of these adventures learning adventures um, already two in the Yukon and one in Mexico um, and so yeah if you want to just share a little bit about getting it together and what that, what that game looks like yeah in my younger years there there were uh, organizations that sort of uh, pretended to be the uh, sort of gateway into interactions with nature like outward bound and there was Knowles and these were organizations that had their origin in England I believe and uh, the uh, the origin of outward bound was that the, uh, the British military wanted to harden up their soldiers so that if they got caught in, if they got shot down over the ocean or whatever, if they got caught in, in, in a really challenging situation, they just, they would, uh, they would have enough internal fortitude to, uh, to pull it together and survive rather than just give up. And so their motto was to strive and not to yield. And uh, I've always thought that the ethos of uh, getting it together is, is to yield and not to strive. <laughs> so we're coming at this thing from the sort of opposite uh, direction and uh, seeing the outdoors and nature as going home as opposed to uh, leaving home and going into uh, a hostile hostile place or a hostile environment and uh, uh, <clears throat> we haven't quite perfected that yet <laughs> as Sierra can tell but uh, it's it's been a fun uh, approach and I think it has a lot more 
that it can teach us as, as we uh, continue to work with it. Um, I'll just share that just very, like the very bare bone structure of this. It's actually quite simple and any one of you could try it out. Um, it's, so the game has roles that are co-created and they're only, they're created in the moment um, with whoever shows up for the game. Um, and the idea is to go into the wilderness or into the forest, um, wherever, into some undomesticated, untamed territory <laughs> with a group of people um, and to get it together. And so there's nothing is planned ahead of time, um, including where we actually go, what we bring with us, um, and so we meet in a location and then we kind of put different options into a hat of where, like which forest we go to or which mountain, and we pick it out of a hat so it's randomized. Um, and then that's where we end up going and we decide together based on kind of using the, 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 the baseline is kind of care. How do we, um, what do we need? What are people's comfort levels? Um, and to, to feel like they're cared for um, and different people have different comfort levels with being in the outdoors and so somebody might choose to bring a tent and bring a sleeping bag and somebody might actually want the challenge of not bringing a tent um, some people might bring you know chocolate bars because <laughs> they really need to have their daily uh, intake of sugar um, and some people might choose to not bring food at all and just forage um, and so the idea is to um, bring just enough so that we are we're comfortable and we are, our needs are taken care of our basic needs but not so much that we don't learn something um, so each time kind of playing with each, each iteration of this game to maybe try for something you know maybe maybe this time I could go without shoes or maybe this time you know we don't have to bring a lighter we can just bring matches or we can bring a, a bow drill um, and and so it's, yeah, it's a game that I invite you all to play. <laughs> um, it really, yeah, it's good to have, we've learned over the years that one of the most powerful things about this game is actually to have um, diverse, so like the more diversity in the group in terms of um, uh, experience in the outdoors is better. Um, and it's really magic. It's really like, full digital detox fully being present with who you're with in the mountains or wherever it is that you end up um and yeah i could i could go on and on about it but maybe maybe you can join us on one someday um, it's yeah it's really special um yeah so i'll pass it to you andrea to share about siguiendo pasos andinos which is another another game that we're playing yeah so before that, I just wanted to add that I've never been in getting it together in one of those, but the, I love the stories after those ones because they are doing it like in the Yukon or in Mexico with one also. <laughs> and yeah, so also I was wondering like, oh, this, I don't know if we can do this in the Andes. Like we don't have food in altitude. Like they, we, we literally don't have food. So maybe we could, yeah, we could try someday with altitude, <laughs> but I don't know how that will go. In a way, we do that because, yeah, we'll, Keto will will share about Siguiendo Pasos Andinos and just wanted to add um, that there are things that happen in getting it together <laughs> that are really amazing. And I met people that when they're like Albert, for example, he just... I don't know, you see just how things change after they are into that, those experiences, this idea that we are deep, 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 deep in nature, then we we just get to feel how nature is there for us and how we are abundant there. And yeah, nothing else matters. So I I feel like it's a really powerful experience. And okay, now passing to another project, which is part also of, of Adventure Versity. It's what we are doing in the Andes, and it's Siguiendo Pasos Andinos. 
and uh, I'll pass it to Hero so you can share a bit more about it. Hi everyone, um, can you hear me well? Because yes. um, I'm not at home. Uh, we have 14 hour power cuts as Andrea said. Um, so I needed to come to a different place. I unfortunately don't have all the pictures on my phone that I wanted to share. So I'll be sharing them on my laptop screen, which hasn't internet, but my phone has. So um, if there are any issues, I apologize um, right now. Um, so so uh, thank you so much for sharing all these stories, Eric, Sierra, Andre. Um, so with Pasos Andinos, um, our project actually started three years ago. And the project was, we actually invented, we, we co-created to use a very ecoversity word, uh, a project um, that was based around three main ideas um, because we were uh, three uh, co-creators. So Andrea, uh, Juanito and myself, I'll show a picture of uh, our group in the mountains. Uh, so this is my laptop. This is my cousin's uh, little dog. And uh, here is Andrea, this is myself, this is uh, Pancho El Sur, a friend from Chile, and Juanito. And so Juanito, myself, and Andrea, we started uh, Siguiendo Pasos Andinos, um, and we all had our different quests and searches. And so Andrea wanted to learn more what, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here because it's a little bit more complex, what we can learn from and in the mountains. Uh, I had more of a historical quest or a question, so I wanted to see which place the Cordillera Blanca, so the Peruvian Andes have um, in mountaineering history. Uh, Pancho El Sur, he is a friend, so he, he wasn't, let's say, uh, in the original plan, but uh, we did a lot of mountaineering with him, top guy. And uh, Juanito, who uh, was uh, actually training for um, the local uh, guiding school, so he had more of a technical uh, quest. And uh, Andrea, Juanito, and myself, we were all, we are all in the same mountaineering club, Club de Andinismo Politécnico, which is a mountaineering club located here in Quito, in Ecuador. And we have um, a lot of mountains close by, so we are actually very spoiled in that sense that we can go into the mountains uh, very often uh, and very high as well. We have a 6,000 meter peak, um, uh, which we can do in a weekend, which is an absolute luxury. Um, and so we are formed in the same mountaineering club. And in our mountaineering club, it is um, when you organize a project, it is um, common that you make some sort of product like a T-shirt or in our case, stickers um, to sell to your friends. And we even had some, um, I would say, uh, sponsorships by uh, friends who had brands or friends who had like um, miles on their credit cards. And that was a way to um, basically cover the costs of our um of our project. Um, so the first year, actually the first two years, we it was actually quite smooth sailing with it, um, some beautiful um, mountains. We climbed around Rapalca, uh, which is a mountain of uh, 6,000 meters, and it's a, a wall of 900 meters um, in altitude difference. This Andrea being badass on Ran Rapalca, um, and which had absolutely excellent conditions. So it, it didn't feel dangerous at all. Um, it actually felt quite safe and it was all smooth uh, sailing. Um, one of the excuses to go to the Cordillera Blanca was this mountain, uh, Pucarandra. And um, here I'll delve very shortly in a little bit of Ecuadorian mountaineering history. Um, in 1958, there was an elite group of mountaineers, among them uh, Remo Lambert, a Swiss mountain guide that climbed in the Himalayas, who organized an expedition to this mountain, Pucarandra. And um, with Andrea, we wanted to see what this mountain was like. And this is the first mountain climbed by an Ecuadorian outside of Ecuador. So that's what makes it uh, special. And it hasn't been repeated very often uh, since. It actually, maybe has like a dozen ascents. And you can see why, because it has very complex and tricky terrain. Um, there are just lots of uh, crevasses and, and, and seracs and even cornices. Um, so we didn't even attempt a mountain that was uh, climbed in the 1950s because it was literally too big and maybe even too dangerous for us. But it was one of the excuses to go and see uh, this mountain and to understand what they had seen in those years. They, did they see beauty? Did they see challenge? Did they see, I don't know, something else? Uh, greatness, something spiritual? I don't know. Um, so, But it's a very nice trek, a very beautiful valley. Um, and to thank our sponsors, and this was very special to us, I think, 
uh, we wrote little letters uh, about our stories with the local uh, scribes. And uh, in Huaraz, so um, they're still a part of the population that doesn't write well, I would say. So it, it's not technically an alphabetism, but um, they aren't literate enough to write, let's say, like a legal letter. But in, <laughs> in, an, in another sense, who is actually um, sufficiently um, educated to write a, a legal letter. So there are scribes who are specialized in uh, legal terms. And so we dictated them something totally outside of their comfort zone, which was, uh, let's say, like mountaineering stories. Um, and it felt as challenging to us as it was uh, to them. But every one of our sponsors, um, and I say sponsor very, very, I would say lightly, because most of them were actually just friends saying like, hey, it's fine, you can go climbing, I'll, I'll sponsor something like a t-shirt or a hoodie um, and so on. Um, and they all received a, a letter, which was very fun actually to hand out. Um, and so the second year, it actually was all um, also kind of smooth sailing, I would say. We uh, had the pleasure to visit this beautiful mountain, Togyarrahu. It's um, when we were going down, the clouds started to come in. Um, and we saw this face, and which we attempted this year. So uh, I'll show with my finger. So usually you come this way round, and then you try to climb all the way like this. Um, and this was actually the first year, and I think when the things... When 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 mountaineering isn't smooth sailing anymore, that's when you start to learn. So there was actually like uh, some avalanche danger uh, from the top. The face was actually very icy, so it was um, very very hard to climb. Um, and we had a little bit of uh, I would say logistical issues with our um, our team because we're two rope teams of two, and so. Um, yeah, we, we needed to re reorganize ourselves to um, try to tempt both teams the, the same wall the same day. Um, and so it, it didn't, it, it wasn't smooth sailing. And so one of the things I think we learned on this particular mountain is that um, you always kind of need to warm up because this year we entered this mountain basically from zero. And so it's like a, maybe like a sports car or something. You can go from a zero to a hundred, but you need to have like a, a very big engine. And ours wasn't um, apparently big enough, so to speak. Um, so I think that was one of the most valuable lessons from uh, this year that you always need to kind of warm up and ease into um, the activity a little bit. Um, and I don't, I don't know how that is, for instance, in the Yukon, if you kind of need to ease, in, ease into nature or uh, you just go, uh, go for it and, and um, get surprised by the uh, experience. Um, this is one from last year as well, Shaksha. Which I always think that things that uh, think that looks like a little face. So here we have the um, the the mouth and the nose, uh, which was all in very good conditions, uh, very nice climbing, uh, absolutely beautiful scenery. It was we did this mountain with a couple of friends in three days, but uh, most parties do them in two days. And why did we do it in three days? Because it was so nice to just hang around there. The high camp is absolutely beautiful, and the views are are absolutely stunning because. The Cordillera Blanca is, I think, one of the, the, the most beautiful um, mountain ranges that I've seen um, in my life yet. Um, and this is one, I think, also inspiration because we, the first two years and maybe the third year as well, we were kind of in search of the classics of the Cordillera Blanca because there's a lot you can learn from the classics in the Cordillera Blanca. And this is La Sphinx. You can see it's like it has a little bit of form of a sphinx. You can see here the back and these are maybe the, the paws and this might be the head. And the normal road goes kind of straight through this phase and ends up here a little bit to the right. Um, and I climbed it the first year with a friend and the second year we attempted it with uh, Andrea. And as a rope team, we came a little bit short. Uh, I was a little sick actually. And so we stranded more or less in the middle. And I think both of us, we learned quite a lot. Yeah, like how do we work as a team? Uh, how much can one person open? How much do, uh, do two persons need to open to climb such a nice face. Um, and so this place, I think, is still full of magic. And and um, although it's a big wall, it, it is fairly safe if you have a, a good logistical uh, plan. Like you need to plan, yeah, like to climb it in one single day. So you need to go really light and fast um, and be prepared like to um, suffer a little bit. So we, we learned a lot from these climbs, um, especially, for instance, on, on how our skin reacts to uh, high altitude and dryness and so on. So 
I think every year we're uh, better prepared, but still um, this year was the one with uh, most uh, learnings and teachings. This one, a uh, picture of the, of the big wall. This is a friend climbing, Roberto. Um, and in the back, you can see the one doys, a really beautiful mountain massif. And you can see it's really nice uh, granite, uh, which we don't have in Ecuador, but in Peru, they, um, they have quite a lot of mountains with granite. Um, and so, yeah, um, this is Andre climbing in Hatun Machai, which is one of the most, I think one of the most amazing climbing areas, um, which is absolutely beautiful. And these are like uh, really solid, really um, clean uh, climbing slabs and overhangs. Uh, it's like a, a, a wood uh, full of rocks. Um, and yeah, so this is us. <laughs> you can see Andre is a little bit happier than I am. I have a little bit of a grin. I think this was on Togia Rajo, around 6,000 meters. Um, and so I want to just to end up with this picture because I think uh, for myself, I, I can speak that Chakra Rajo is still a dream. I think Andre also dreams of Chakra Rajo one day. And we saw it on the first year. And I think our project has like, um, has opened the possibilities to um, dream a little bit to climb in the mountains in uh, Peru. Um, that is more or less what I had prepared. Where are you guys? Oh, no. Uh, oh, there are you. Um, what I had prepared this, for this session, I don't know if there are any questions or, um, or yeah, anything someone else wants to share. I'll probably have no internet in roughly 10 minutes just for uh, information so you can have your questions with Andrea. <laughs> I, just something that I would like to add is like, um, so this is like a project that we made up literally in in service of our lives <laughs> and to be able to find ways of doing what we love and learning with the mountains that we love. This year we were like eight people that organized to be together in, in, in the project also. And oh, so many learnings, like we were like relational learnings, like this idea of who, like hierarchical, we were with guides, we have friends that are uh, mountaineer guides, and they were like bringing that, like books, their books, and they're like, no, I have this title and things. So it's just incredible to learn together because the mountains kind of put you in your place. <laughs> So it doesn't matter how many books you read or how prepared you are, because in this we need to prepare a bit, like uh, we just bringing as less as we can. But this, like, we are we are never prepared to go to a mountain. Like, we do the best we can, the human things that what we can control, but we are never really prepared with what could happen. Yeah, there. So okay. that's like something that. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that. And yeah, open up for questions. See if you have some more comments. Yeah, I'll just comment that uh, <clears throat> making me nostalgic for my uh, mountaineering days. In the beginning, but now that we've got this, hmm. yeah, thank you, Hedo, for bringing in those photos. I realized I should have shared photos from getting it together. I, I shared an album into the chat. Um, yeah, it's so hard to describe it, <laughs> it's so much easier to get a sense of what we're talking about through the images. And so, yeah, every time you all share photos from the mountains. Like, Oh, it's just like it's so much beauty you can almost like not even take it in and that through photos imagine being there so thank you for bringing us that beauty and, to, and visiting um, the mountains and, yeah bringing that back to us any other mountain experiences that want to be shared. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, <clears throat> I stopped mountaineering because I almost got killed like three or four times. And so I thought, <laughs> no, <clears throat> my lifespan is going to be longer if I stop doing this. 
but uh, yeah, I, I totally understand the incredible appeal of uh, the high mountains and and uh, just hope you guys uh, stay safe. We'll do our best. <laughs> Um, I love Andrea's comment. Where do we sign up for the next adventure? I'm not prepared, so I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to, I mean, if you have my contact, message me um, or share your email into the chat. I'm happy to. I'm, I'm not sure when. I think actually our next getting it together will be in Costa Rica in maybe March. 